Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God now and forever Amen. Amen. let us be seated A reading from Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O oh, seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be, a ho to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight that he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined accordance to, according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope in Christ, may live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers have work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodotus, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. 
and Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted him killed. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he did not yet, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and danced. I'm sorry. Gave a banquet for his couriers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask for me whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took John's body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Ben only offered you half the sermon time that you usually enjoy last week, so I'll be sure to add the balance this week, <laughs> just so you aren't left wanting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Growing up, the rules at my house were fairly standard. Share your things, don't rough house with your brothers, chew with your mouth closed, do your chores, preferably without complaining, watch your mouth. And to that end, there was one word that we were very explicitly forbidden to say. If one wants to accentuate the word, it can indeed be split into two, but the result of uttering this one word would result in immediate and very unpleasant consequences. And since my parents aren't here, I'm going to say it out loud from this pulpit. <laughs> Shut up. That's the trouble with today's gospel story. I think that it can be veritably summed up by that terrible word, shut up. King Herod in Mark's gospel gets us started. He'd reluctantly given the official command to shut John the baptizer up. Herod had illegally married, illicitly married, his brother's wife and brought her into his home together with her daughter, his niece. John seems to have had Herod's ear and told him that this was indeed an illicit relationship for all sorts of terrible reasons, and to send the woman and her daughter away, which very much annoyed Herod's new wife, Herodias, to the point of a scathing grudge. She wanted John to stop naming their infidelity in forums that seemed to unsettle the royal family and resulted in regional gossip. She wanted her happily ever after at the palace in peace without judgment. So Herodias indeed found a way to shut John up. 
At Herod's birthday party, Herod demands that his niece, cum stepdaughter, to perform a dance and is so pleased with the results that he promises her anything she'd like, even up to half the kingdom. And she asks her mother what to get, and her mother advises the head of John the Baptist. The girl herself adds this revolting detail on a platter. Herod is grieved and yet feels hamstrung in front of his guests and follows through. John is indeed shut up, his head silenced and dished up on a platter. The story, in my reading of it, is indeed a forerunner of the Easter story. It's sort of a, an Easter in miniature. The story is much longer than just about anything else in Mark's narrative. And Jesus is mentioned in this gospel exactly once. Just in that opening sentence saying, eh, King Herod kind of heard about Jesus and his disciples because Jesus' name had become known. For a Sunday gospel reading, that's not a lot of Jesus. But why had Jesus' name become known? Why had that perked up Herod? Because like you heard last Sunday, Jesus was developing a pretty powerful reputation, healing and raising people from rather low, desperate, and deadly places. And by now, Herod was in a low, desperate, and deadly place with his wife nammering in his ear. And so he put a man to death on account of his unlawfully wedded wife's resentments to save face in front of a crowd. When, Jesus, when Herod heard about Jesus' deeds of power, he reflected, huh, maybe that's John. Maybe John, who I beheaded, has been raised. Clearly, Herod experienced John as powerful. It is therefore difficult to tell whether Herod is saying these words with hope or with anxiety. Hope, because Herod seems to have taken a very positive interest in John. The story remarks that Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, yet he liked to listen to him. Herod liked John's company, perhaps from shreds of decency or out of interest, even sort of amusement. So it's possible that Herod was optimistic that his executed death warrant didn't stick and that he could have his old buddy back. But you could also read Herod's words as anxiety because he identified John as a righteous and holy one. A state-issued death warrant isn't exactly what one might predict for such a guy. After suffering a wrongful death, a resurrected John could, I think, reasonably be madder than a hornet, madder than a hornet and saying true things even worse than in the first place about the illicit royal union and with good cause. After violently killing John, what would a resurrected John have to say about his ordeal and the reasons behind it? I wouldn't want to hear that. So it's hardly a leap to see how all of humanity has the same response toward another death warrant that Herod helps to execute a short while later toward Jesus. It's hardly a leap to see how all of humanity has the same response to Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. Hope, because Jesus was righteous and holy. Folks like to listen to him. They followed him around. He gains a reputation. He heals. He raises people. He points those in earshot toward God's life-giving promises and breathes on them God's own Holy Spirit so they have ears to hear. Wouldn't it be great to have such a one among us alive and well and active in the world? Except, of course, it's the same world that conspired to kill him. Herod becomes part of the machinations of political, cultural, and religious forces of the time, which could all be so easily mistaken for contemporary political, cultural, and religious forces today, which could all just be easily mistaken for us, demanding Jesus' blood. When Jesus offers up a stray word that no one likes, you know, just shut up. And three days later, though, despite humanity's best efforts to shut Jesus up, Jesus stood back up, and got right back to work, announcing new life despite the death-dealing ways of the world. Life in Jesus' words and actions looks like indiscriminately giving people promises they need for the sake of life now, and suggesting that these same promises will apply for life in the world to come. As we pray for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, right here, right now, among us, 
this point, I'm fairly confident that all of us have heard about yet another shut up event, an attempt to silence former US President Donald Trump, who is campaigning just north of here in Butler by killing him. At this point, media sources have confirmed that two people died and more are wounded. People have indeed been shut up, though the intended target was not. My friend and colleague Matt mentioned that in his reflection, Donald Trump in the end really just is a man, a man who can bleed, a man that many don't think should be president again, even a man who might put our institutions and our allies in danger. And all that besides, he is in fact a man. If there is rot in him and his leadership, it's a symptom, perhaps not the disease and that he deserves the same safety as all my neighbors. And so do the people who gathered to hear him speak. My own opinions about Donald Trump have not changed since last night, yet I'm rattled by the political event in this country, which is a freedom in the United States, a place at which my neighbors were attacked and killed. It speaks to how when we spend overwhelming time and energy and psychic bandwidth convincing ourselves that our neighbors are monsters, rather than God's children, these things will keep on happening. I noticed last night that similarities abound between Herodias nursing a grudge and goading her royal spouse to deadly action, and a resentful young man from Bethel Park goaded by media, social and otherwise, also to deadly action. Abraham Lincoln, in his first inaugural address, said the following, just at the beginning at the, at, the, at the entry point to what eventually became the Civil War. He said, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break the bonds of our affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. Could you imagine if that had been Herodias and Herod's posture towards John, rather than nursing that grudge and killing him? What would have changed about Herod's decision regarding Jesus and a cross a short time later? None of the people in or adjacent to today's scripture texts had nor exercised any right to vote for elected leaders. They were all subject to military and royal whims from above, Herod, uh, Herod, uh, King Herod Antipas held the throne by way of birth, assassination of some of his siblings, and happenstance. He was not elected. He acted within his royal legal rights to kill John and anyone else he deemed a bother or a challenge, no matter how we today might appropriately condemn his actions. Humanity has lived throughout documented uh, humanity has lived throughout a documented history under conditions like these, under the thumb of tyrants and despots and dictators and royals who hardly serve the best interests of the people or the land. As citizens of the United States of America, though, we do have the right to vote leadership in or out of office. As my mother and father ruled the house growing up, telling me that I had no right to use the word shut up, our country has similar, similarly agreed with that general posture. Instead, together with you, we share the right to say, more of this, less of that. We have the right to turn down the volume. If one doesn't like a platform or policy perspective of a leader, well, cast a vote for another candidate and convince other people to join you. Turn down the volume and vote in favor of that which you'd like to hear and experience more. We do not have the right to shut people up. To shut someone up is to fire a weapon, or disable, or murder. There are other more life-giving ways to silence a voice that you do not agree with, voices that you do not wish to hear or follow. Even early church leaders knew this, when under the rule of figures that often rose to challenge even Herod's violent predilections, they created the great litany, which includes these lines, from all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the cunning assaults of the devil, and from an unprepared and evil death, good Lord, deliver us and from war, bloodshed, and violence, from corrupt and unjust government, and from sedition and treason. Good Lord, deliver us. Each week, you agree with that prayer. Each week, you are voting with your own bodies to be here in this place, God's own place where you hear God's resurrection promise given for you. 
God does not reserve good promises only for luminaries like John and Jesus. God is for you too. You vote for the truth that God through Jesus Christ is in the business of declaring your forgiveness, not just for you, but also for your neighbor. As you appear here to receive the waters of baptism, the bread and the cup and words of grace. Appearing here in worship, you demonstrate that your faith is primarily located in your confidence that Jesus draws into his own body humanity's shut up and raises it a resurrection. Your faith is at work when you hear a candidate for office and say, that doesn't sound like a promise to me. And you vote differently rather than taking up arms in outrage. You demonstrate Christian faith. You announce God's presence where your ears hear and your attention turns. Jesus Christ will not cease telling you that yours is a life that God created, that yours is a life that God sustains, and that yours is a life that God will raise for life in the world to come. Such faith gave John courage to announce God's will, and such faith will raise you together with John, like Jesus, on the last day. Let's live in that hope. Let's live in that hope, that faith, and that confidence because that's what finally gets the last word. Amen. Please rise and join with me in proclaiming our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one God, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, in the heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are found in your liturgy, page 11. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nation of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light we praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. For Donald and Thomas, for Lee, Tor and Karen, Bill and Caroline, for Diane, Rana and Cooper, Lee and Layla, for Tilly, Noah, for those suffering in the heat of summer, 
for all who travel, whether for pleasure or escaping danger, for energy and joy at our summer dinner church, for God to grow and prosper our Helping Hands summer ministries. And we pray the Book of Common Prayer's prayer for the nation. Almighty God, who has given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly ask you that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of your favor and glad to do your will. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people, the multitudes brought out of many kindreds and tongues. Endue with the spirit of wisdom those who in your name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to your law, we may show forth your praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the days of trouble, suffer not our trust in you to fail. All which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, for, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily to sin that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways the glory of your Almighty God has mercy on you, forgives you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthens you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keeps you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share the peace. I'd like to share a few announcements with you. Good morning and welcome. We want to offer, of course, a special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us today, whether this is your first time here or you've been here so many times you can't even remember when you started. We also want to share the peace with everyone who is with us worshiping at home. So if you can turn and share the peace on the camera. Peace be with you as well. Our announcements include to a reminder that tonight is dinner church at 5 o'clock p.m. Martha Banwell and Barry Rogers are offering up mac and cheeses for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and so I hope that you're going to be able to come and bring a lot of life and light and energy to this wonderful dinner opportunity. We're going to be talking about how God makes long distance calls using uh, the book of Ruth, the first chapter. 
So please come, please bring your friends, please bring your kids if you have them, or the neighbor's kids, either way. I also want to let you know that we're doing a, just a fun project. I know that there are so many people in this congregation who have produced articles, books, poetry, artwork. This congregation is full of people who are creative and very, very bright. And so if you have a publication or something that you want to share, we want to take the top rung or two of that, uh, of that bookshelf as you enter into the parish hall to display your works and let people know about how they might be able to not just view them, but if it's a book, maybe how they can access them. So if you want to give those to me, I'd like to get that set up as soon as possible. I even had someone, Janet, mention that she helps produce a podcast. And so we're going to have a card there with information about how you can hear her podcast related to immigration. And so if you have something, please give it to me. And we'll make sure that we put a sign on the, on the, the object or the, the work saying, you know, please don't take it, but you can peruse it here. And we'll make sure that you are highlighted. I'd also like to invite now uh, a representative of the Helping Hands Ministry, Janet again, to come and introduce our Foster Love Project for the summer. So I don't think I'm introducing this because we've, we've heard a lot about it, but just a reminder that we're in the midst of our campaign of uh, collecting school supplies for children who are in foster care. Um, we're collecting everything from uh, notebooks and folders and magic markers to tennis shoes and sweatshirts and backpacks. If you haven't seen it already, there's a list at the back. We're collecting them through the last Sunday of July. And so please step up and love your neighbors in this very concrete way. Um, if you have anything with you today, you're welcome to put it in the box when you come up for communion, just like the food that we bring for the Wilkinsburg Food Pantry. These are signs of our appreciation for all that we have and of our love for our neighbors. And um, if you haven't yet contributed anything, you have time to do so. And I really hope that you think about the children who are going to receive these items. Think about their eyes sparkling when they see all the colors in their pencil box. Think about the promise of that new page ready to write on. Think about the softness of the sweatshirt on a fall morning or the bounce in those tennis shoes that make them run fast. And please contribute whatever you can. Thank you so much. And so with that, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
same gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now let us pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, Power and glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and receive them in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
Let us rise and pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us a spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. The world in all of its ways indeed tried to shut Christ up, and the plan failed. You are now alive in Jesus Christ by faith, and you are now released to be very noisy about the gifts that God has placed in, with, and through you. And so now into this week, go out and proclaim the life of God, the life that God has given you, and the life that you will provide by serving your neighbor through you in both word and action. And so may the spirit of truth lead you into all truth, giving you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to proclaim the wonderful works of God and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.